Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, you may have heard about the home in North St. Louis near the Westlake landfill where radioactive dust has been found inside the kitchen at over 1,000 times background radiation and with a radioactive signature that links it directly to Westlake Landfill. Robin Ellison Daly and her husband own that house, and on today's show we talk with her about that nightmare and how it has been unfolding for them. Plus, our regular numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report on what's gone wrong this week with those aging reactors, and more honest nuclear information than mainstream media stars and producers were able to bring up in an improperly private meeting they had with a rampaging, tongue-lashing Trump. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, November 22nd, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. Starting off in Japan, where yesterday, November 21st, a 7.3 earthquake hit off the coast of Fukushima and generated a tsunami. We watched this in real time over the Internet as workers were evacuated from the Fukushima Daiichi facility. The public was told, please flee immediately. As the sirens went off in the background, officials urged residents of coastal areas to evacuate to higher ground. As we watched and waited, a 60-centimeter, two-foot tsunami was observed at Fukushima's Onohama port and a 90-centimeter, or three-foot tsunami, at Soma, with some tsunami waves being reported as high as 1.4 meters, or the equivalent of four feet. The quake knocked out the cooling system for Fukushima Daini, the sister plant to Fukushima Daiichi. Fukushima Daini number 3 spent fuel pool. It took nine hours before the pumps were fixed at that spent fuel pool and operated again, during which time the temperature rose from 27.7 degrees centigrade to 29.5 degrees centigrade. Still within a safe zone, but danger is over 65 degrees centigrade, which is the equivalent of 149 degrees Fahrenheit. So where was Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, operators of the demolished and still dangerous Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility? About 40 minutes after the quake, TEPCO announced that they found no abnormality in the Fukushima plant. Only much later, on the evening of November 22nd, did TEPCO announce that the radiation monitoring post in the Pacific Ocean has been suspended due to the quake. The post is situated at the end of the breakwater of the Fukushima plant port, and they cannot monitor the radioactive substances that are spreading into the Pacific Ocean with this monitoring post out of order. TEPCO also admitted that the underwater fence was damaged and coolant water got out of the common spent fuel pool because of the quake, though they did not explain the exact volume of the water that sloshed out. The best roundup of information as to the damage found at Fukushima Daiichi after the quake and tsunami comes from fukuleaks.org, sometimes known as simply info, with direct input from Nuclear Hot Seat interviewee Nancy Faust. Their Roundup article states that so far there is no reporting of the status of the storage tanks up on the hill behind the wreck of Fukushima Daiichi. There is major concern about the aging, bolt-together tanks that are still partially in use. There have also been no reports of the status of the Unit 1 and 2 vent tower that has existing damage. 
Contaminated water transfer from the reactor building basements was stopped after the quake and was not resumed for nine hours. The same for reverse osmosis desalination system, which took nine and a half hours to get back online. The cesium adsorption systems required almost 11 hours to get back running. Both the north and south silt fences in the port were damaged, and these are devices used to try to keep small radioactive debris from leaving the port. How nice of them to have never informed us that there were small pieces of radioactive debris that needed to be kept from leaving the port. And the sea level at Fukushima Daiichi rose one meter. While the worst of the danger seems to be over, an official, not saying what he's an official of, but an official named Koji Nakamura warned Japanese broadcasters NHK that another quake of a similar scale could occur within a week, which may also generate a tsunami. In the first 24 hours after the initial tembler, at least 18 aftershocks, some of them sizable, have been recorded. We'll have more about this latest earthquake in Japan and what it means during today's final thought. Meanwhile, the nuclear spin cyclists continue to attempt to normalize Fukushima in the mind of the public. The president of the world's baseball governing body played down fears that the sport's top stars will refuse to play in Fukushima if the nuclear disaster hit prefecture hosts games at the 2020 Olympics. Olympics chiefs are currently considering a proposal to play part of the Tokyo 2020 baseball and softball competition in Fukushima Prefecture. Now, they've been working towards this for a while. The prefecture successfully hosted games at the Under-15 Baseball World Cup in the city of Iwaki this summer. And World Baseball Softball Confederation President Ricardo Fracari believes senior teams will not be deterred from playing there in 2020 should its bid to host games be accepted. Three venues in the prefecture are under consideration in Iwake, Fukushima, and Koryama. There's a new luxury hotel in Fukushima Prefecture, Hotel Aalto which provides radiation readings on its website that are taken at the hotel and other areas of Japan. Takishi Munakata, owner of the hotel, says that it's important for the hotel to provide readings because, quote, it's difficult to communicate the safety of the region when information comes from the government. John Japanese will not trust the credibility. Also, he added, saying, it is safe! only draws attention to the issue so it doesn't really help. And let's face it, most people don't believe it. This story is Numbnuts Adjacent. It's about 13 teenagers from Fukushima High School who toured the site of the crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant by bus on November 18, only three days ahead of the earthquake and tsunami, to get a first-hand look at the work of decommissioning the reactors. It was the first tour by youngsters since the disaster as plant operator Tokyo Electric Power Company had deemed the radiation risk too high. No word as to why they now believe that the radiation risk was not too high. But for the really big story of bad timing, you've got to hear... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that sound a week. Talk about your timing. Fukushima has announced that it is mounting a winter tourism offensive to draw foreigners to its snowy charms. And when did they announce this campaign? On Sunday, November 20th, just the day before the most recent earthquake and tsunami in Fukushima. Mm -mm -mm. The prefecture is inviting tourists from Taiwan, Thailand, and Australia to come on up for a fun-packed visit. And they want them up there so much that they are subsidizing nearly all transportation and accommodation costs. That's right, they will pay you to go to Fukushima, perhaps because nobody really wants to do it on their own. See, 
The purpose of the project is to promote Fukushima's name overseas as something other than a place where three melted down nuclear reactors are still out of control. They're hoping this little promotion of theirs raises occupancy at hotels and inns and bolsters jobs in the tourism industry. They're coordinating the work with their tourism offices. Yes, Fukushima has tourism offices in Taiwan and Thailand and is also coordinating with travel agencies. Participants can ski, snowboard, and have snowball fights in Fukushima's powdered snow. In total ignorance of any possible radiation readings, tourists will be invited to soak in hot springs. And who knows, they may even be opening up one of those spent fuel pools to give them a really hot soak. And, of course, opera ski, they'll have a chance to sample the local cuisine and taste sake from Fukushima, so popular at home and abroad. While most of the expenses will be covered by Fukushima Prefecture, epidemiological studies and medical tracking are not included. Oh, whoever dreamed this one up, let alone the day to launch it, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seat, none that's out of the week. Over to the U.S. now, where there's good news for those people fighting against Indian Point who haven't been getting back to me for the interviews that I want to do so that I can do a feature on it. But be that as it may, in a unanimous decision, the New York State Court of Appeals has determined that the New York Department of State was correct in its determination that it has the right to review Entergy's federal license renewal applications as the company seeks to operate the Indian Point nuclear reactors for another 20 years. Judge Sheila Abdus Salam stated, Entergy's current application for a license to operate the Indian Point nuclear reactors for an additional 20 years is a new federal action involving a new project with different impacts and concerns than were present with the initial environmental impact statements that were issued over 40 years ago. Indian Point's two reactors are now beyond the initial 40-year scope of their federal licenses. One of the licenses expired in September of 2013, the other in December of 2015. So right now, they're driving without a license. I don't think you or I could get away with that for long, do you? Entergy's renewal efforts have been opposed by Governor Andrew Cuomo, who has consistently said that he believes Indian Point should be shut down due to the peril, whether from terrorism or natural disaster, or unnatural disaster, which is what nuclear is, implicit in its proximity to New York City. In North St. Louis, radioactive waste was confirmed inside a family home less than half a mile from the Westlake Landfill, the site of radioactive waste tied to the Manhattan Project. Radioactive thorium-230 was found in dust in the home of Robin Ellison Daly and her husband, Mike Daly, in the area of Spanish Village, a subdivision adjacent to the Westlake Landfill. Karen Nickel, with Just Moms STL, says... Allowing people to live inside of homes that are contaminated with the world's oldest nuclear weapons waste is unacceptable and extremely irresponsible. The Missouri Attorney General indicates a Chernobyl-like event could occur if or when the underground fire at the adjacent Bridgeton landfill collides with the Manhattan Project waste, and there is no way to put that fire out. It's been burning now for over six years. There is a higher than normal incidence of brain cancer in children under 17 in areas around Westlake, and families are sick with bloody noses, asthma, and other respiratory illnesses, and often keep children indoors because the toxic odors are so bad. There will be much more information on this during our featured interview today with the owner of the home, Robin Ellison Daly. In Colorado, first findings in a health study identify clusters of illness in communities downwind from the former Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. 
Preliminary results from an ongoing health study suggest that residents who lived in communities near the Rocky Flats nuclear plant between 1952 and 1992 may experience unusual illnesses, including specific cancers that can be linked to radiation exposure. The survey drew more than 1,700 responses over seven months, which were analyzed for both health and geographic information. More than 40% of the reported cancers are classified as rare, meaning that they generally affect less than 15 of 100,000 people per year. The early indicators warrant more extensive research. The Rocky Flats plant was located 16 miles northwest of downtown Denver and only 7 miles from Boulder, Colorado in Arvada. For almost 40 years, employees used plutonium to build triggers for nuclear weapons. Erica Gray of the Sierra Club reported that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was having Internet problems and unable to post its reports on failures and problems at nuclear plants. But just in time for Nuclear Hot Seat, the information was posted, so it's time for our duck (coughs) and cover report. Oyster Creek in New Jersey went into hot shutdown on November 20th, An automatic scram during main turbine testing, which is an event or condition that results in actuation of the reactor protection system when the reactor is critical. (coughs) At Indian Point in New York on November 21st, there was a service water leak inside the vapor containment building. (coughs) At the Columbia Generating Station in Washington on November 20th, The reactor building exhaust air fan failed to to start manually, which caused secondary containment pressure boundary to not be met. Don't worry about what it means. Just know that it is an event or condition that could have prevented fulfillment of a safety function needed to control the release of radioactive material and accident mitigation. Fermi in Michigan on November 19, secondary containment technical specification not met during high wind conditions, an event or condition that could have prevented the fulfillment of a safety function needed to control the release of radioactive material. (coughs) Susquehanna in Pennsylvania on November 16, failure of a safe card system switch Needed to maintain the reactor in a safe shutdown condition, remove residual heat, control the release of radioactive material, and mitigate the consequences of an accident. (coughs) I can't even get through them all. Farley in Alabama on November 17. Wolf Creek in Kansas on November 16. And a trifecta for Illinois on November 16 at Dresden, Clinton, and my favorite of the week at Quad Cities, the inadvertent activation of emergency sirens and news release during emergency planning exercise. Oops! There were no reports listed from cardiac units of any local hospitals about possible increases in heart attacks. Doc! (coughs) And thanks to whoever sent me the link to this article from 2014 reporting on how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was hacked three times in three years, with at least two of those attacks traced back to foreigners who used Google Spreadsheet to harvest credentials and malware hosted in Microsoft's OneDrive. It seems that NRC employees do not have the ability to understand when they receive a spear phishing email, that's spelled P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, since falling for the tactic caused the agency to be hacked three times in three years. In one instance, a dozen NRC personnel fell for the trick, and in another, all it took was one. Keeping in mind that the NRC handles databases with the location and condition of nuclear reactors, radioactive waste, and facilities that handle weapons-grade nuclear materials. Don't that just make you feel all warm and cozy and safe? Now let's move on to Ukraine, where Chernobyl is the big, 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 Big news, or is it? The process of sliding the arched structure that is to be the sarcophagus around the sarcophagus and meant to shield the damaged Unit 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant started on Monday, November 14. 
the arch, called the new safe containment, nice bit of branding there, is the largest movable land-based structure ever built. It's meant to contain the still highly radioactive remains of that facility and was expected to take around 40 hours of operation spread over a period of up to five days to accomplish. It is now nine days later, and there is no word of the accomplishment of this structural feat, though there is a lot of wiggle language coming out from our pals who write for World Nuclear News. And now there's a report from Reuters saying that the arch will not be in place until sometime next year. We're working on getting that information for you and hope to have a report within the next week or two. Also at Chernobyl, two Chinese firms plan to build a solar power plant in the exclusion zone around the failed, exploded, hopefully soon to be contained by this new structure, Chernobyl Nuclear Reactor. Apparently, Ukraine has passed a law allowing the site to be developed for agriculture and other things. So according to one Chinese manager who did not want to give his name because he was not authorized to speak to the media but did so anyway, that means the radiation is under control. I don't blame him for not wanting his name in this one. Vietnam's government has decided to dump its long-delayed plan to build the country's first nuclear power plant because other energy sources have become cheaper and demand for power has slackened due to slowing economic growth. The government this week will submit its proposal to cancel the project to the country's lawmaking body, the National Assembly, which is expected to ratify it later this month, according to the official Vietnam News Agency. Working on a story about this one, too. And the operator of Switzerland's nuclear reactors, Alpic, reportedly offered reactors to France's EDF at no cost or a symbolic franc. The French, however, refused the offer. A sign of the times for nuclear. You can't even give one of those things away. We'll have this week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, O. Oh, M G. Is it possible that it is only four and a half weeks to Christmas and Hanukkah? If you are wondering what to give Nuclear Hot Seat, how about a donation? It's the right size, the right color, always in style, and it supports the work of the show, so it has a long reach and a long life. Any amount will help us keep expanding our reach and build listenership as we help activists around the world link together. So help us keep bringing you verifiable nuclear news from a different perspective. Just go now, right now, hit pause, go there, do it, come back, the show will be waiting for you. But go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red donate button. Whatever you can do to help, know that it is appreciated and you have my thanks and gratitude. Robin Ellison Daly is a member of Just Moms STL. She lives in Spanish Village, a subdivision butt up against the Westlake landfill in North St. Louis. Robin's been in the news lately because she and her husband had their house tested for radiation. And what was discovered? Well, you'll hear more about it in just a moment. Robin and I spoke on Monday, November 21st, not about our most recent Facebook topic, which is the attractiveness of letting one's hair go naturally gray, but the situation with her home and what it's like to be hit with that kind of news. Robin Ellison Daly, thank you so much for being my guest today on Nuclear Hot Seat. Well, thank you, Libby. I greatly appreciate you reaching out to me because this is a very serious development that has just recently occurred around the Westlake landfill issue. Let's take this in a sequential order so that people can understand exactly what's going on and exactly what it means. First of all, tell us where you live and how long you lived in your home and how close it is to the Westlake landfill. I live in a small subdivision of about 92 to 98 homes. The name of the neighborhood is called Spanish Village. It is located in a 
suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, which is called Bridgeton, Missouri, and that little subdivision is located 0.42 miles south of the Westlake Landfill, Bridgeton Landfill. How long have you been aware of the problem with nuclear materials illegally and improperly buried at the Westlake Landfill? Well, my husband and I, along with our 15-year-old son, moved to this community in 1999. And at that time, we were totally unaware, and we just went about our lives of working and raising children. Until about 2011, we saw a young local woman on television speaking about a fire in the Bridgeton Landfill. And she also said, when she was explaining that, that the Department of Natural Resources for the state of Missouri told her that the underground fire was the least of her concern because she needs to also worry about the radioactive waste that is in an adjoining landfill at the Westlake landfill. What was your feeling or your response when you saw this interview? Mike and I, my husband and I, we were just shocked. We looked at each other. We looked at the television. I turned back to Mike and I said, what in the hell have we just moved ourselves into? I never heard of such a thing. I'm from the St. Louis region. I was born and raised here. It's a dirty little secret, this St. Louis Radway's legacy. And now I'm living less than a half a mile from it, and it has become a cause that I and my husband are fighting for some answers for and to eradicate it. How did you become involved in this issue in a larger way, and how did you become part of an activist response to it? At the time my husband and I found out, we also heard that the EPA had instituted and sanctioned its public vehicle for communicating with the public regarding Superfund site, and that is called a community advisory group. So we went to where this community advisory group, EPA sanctioned meeting, was held, and we started to get some more background information about it. And the more we became involved in that, we realized that really we need something more grassroots and our minds went back to the young woman that we had seen on television, Dawn Chapman, first bringing this to light about the underground fire and one landfill working its way towards the red waste and the other landfill. And Mike and I decided that we need to check with this Just Moms STL organization that seemed to fit more our leanings than EPA because you have to be very subdued and mind your P's and Q's, and it's very difficult to do when you are so filled with emotion, fear, and anxiety and trying to hold the EPA accountable. So that's when we decided to find more information about Just Moms and get involved with those ladies, and we have been ever since. What were some of the things that you've done through the years with the Just Moms group? Oh, we have done numerous things. We have gone to Jefferson City to speak on behalf of state legislation that was going to be written that would have benefited the corporate polluter that is owning the landfill, uh, Republic Services. We've also been to Washington, D.C. We have, we've done pickets and informational protests. We've also done a petition drive and delivered 12,000 signatures to our state governor who has ignored those entirely and never acknowledged receipt of them. We have done a lot. Tirelessly, these women have devoted themselves and taken away time from their families to give presentations regarding this rad waste history, how it was processed, how it was illegally and carelessly stored and improperly handled and disposed of in a landfill. It's quite amazing when you see this presentation. It really brings to light how this contamination wound up being over a uh, 100 sites in the St. Louis region. They have spent long, dedicated many, many, many hours for several years, and my husband and I are trying to help them continue to spread the word and support them as much as we can. In this period of time, have you felt any satisfaction with response from either the government, the EPA, your local government officials, 
or were public services. Has anyone acknowledged the problem and taken steps that you would say are in the right direction to coming to some kind of resolution for you and the others who are trapped in the situation? It has been very frustrating, to say the least, trying to learn what a federal agency whose main objective is the protection of human health and the environment is not what this old 60s, 70s hippie gal would have thought she would have been getting involved in. It's much more complicated. It is not all kumbaya, we hear you, we're here to support you. It creates a lot of frustration and miscommunication. And and as far as them hearing us and being responsive, it has its moments of clarity and its moments where it's not so good. And Republic Services, they need to step up and take responsibility for this site that they have bought and they have been managing. They knew full well the history of this site. They have a fiduciary duty to their stockholders. They didn't come into this not knowing and just making a willy-nilly decision. This was a carefully crafted decision, and therefore we want to hold them responsible because they are a responsible party of this disaster uh, waiting to happen down there. And we just need more accountability and more transparency. And it seems the more involved we get, we have very small successes. We mostly have a lot of frustration and feel like we're back to square one again with the EPA as well as Republic. How did you learn that you had radioactivity? I believe it was first discovered in your backyard. Yes, this community has had its fair share of law firms coming and going, seeking clientele for lawsuits which have been settled out of court by Republic Services. So they have also, you know, tied up a lot of these people with those settlements to be hush-hush and they can't uh, talk against Republic or anything about them any longer. So another radiation global environmental law firm came forward and they seem to be able to have the ways and the means rather than being a personal injury law firm. This one is one that really is, is a big gun. And when they came to my husband and I saying that we can surely help you, we have the ways and the means to get this testing done at uh, credible and credentialed third-party sources for testing. We were hesitant because we've been through the lawyer trolling before, but this one was much different. This one was not what we had seen in the past. So we took them up on their offer, and then they brought us these results, which we had always held in the back of our mind that this was a possibility, And yet we hoped and prayed that it would not be the case, that it would show positive for radioactive contamination. But we were willing to accept whatever the results were. And if this is what the results are, and if this is, if we had to be the first ones to take a step out in faith to help show other residents and homeowners that they too must be vigilant, they shouldn't take the word of a government agency or a corporate polluter, that they need to think of their own interests and do right by that. And so that's what brought us to being that really the the first to be tested and to uh, bring the results public to the region. And you're talking about having the inside of your house tested as opposed to the tests that took place in the backyard and along Coldwater Creek and the like. Is that correct? Yes, we have had the inside and the outside of our property on our property tested. Without going into information that might compromise your legal case, what can you tell us about how the tests were done or what areas were tested and the levels of radioactivity that resulted? Well, the uh, radiation technician was here for quite some time. He was here for several hours. I did not follow him around anywhere that he went. I also had other obligations that I had previously committed to, so I did not uh, shadow him in any way. I only assisted him when he was looking for dust, 
because he had a difficult time finding enough dust particles. And then my husband happened to show him a special place underneath our cabinets where the kick plate falls down. And that was like a bingo spot. He said, bingo, that's just what he's looking for. So he found it underneath the kitchen cabinets. This has been reported, publicly reported, under the kitchen cabinets, underneath the, underneath the refrigerator, in our backyard, as well as in our basement, above the basement windows. And I have four windows in my basement. That is what's been tested so far. There is going to be... I am guessing more testing done by the EPA because they want to do their own testing and split the samples with the legal team. So there's going to be more testing. There's plenty more dust. Nobody went up in the attic yet that I know of. First of all, I am so sorry to hear this and to know that you're going through this because it sounds like a tremendous nightmare for one to find out that you've been living with radioactivity within your home. What has been the response of others in your community, in the Just Moms group? Is there now a stampede for others to get their homes tested? Has there been any pushback against you, not only having the tests done, but going public with it? There has definitely been some awareness in the community, and people are reaching out to me, as well as those that attended last week's mom's meeting where the legal team was there to explain the findings and what exactly they do and what all is involved. There are people that even spoke to that legal team during that time, and people are still contacting me for information. And as far as backlash, yes, the attorneys did speak to my husband and I about what's known as the hated hero syndrome. And it wasn't but just a few days ago that I started experiencing this hated hero syndrome on Facebook. It's to be expected we are being more mindful and very cautious about our surroundings, people coming into our neighborhood. All the streets are on courts, so there's only one way in and one way out. And so we're very mindful of who is coming and going up and down our court, who's parking on the side of our of the street. We're just being more and more mindful because we need to be, is what we were warned. Was the testing expensive and was it paid for by you or was this something that the attorneys provided? I do not know the cost. This is all in pursuant to the lawsuit that's been filed, they will get their compensation at the end when any settlement and or jury trial reaches a decision, whichever that may be. So there is no money that has to come out of any residence's pocket right off the bat, nothing whatsoever. Tell us about the lawsuit, what you can of it. Who is it against and what are you asking? It's against nine defendants mostly that have connection to either the processing of the uranium or in some way or fashion involved with the transportation of the rad waste that was illegally dumped here and the current uh, landfill owners and any subsidiaries of theirs. So it's quite an extensive lawsuit. They're seeking all sorts of damages. You know, uh, pain and suffering, loss of home value, medical monitoring, you know, just the egregious way that this stuff was handled. And homes were built around it, and it was dumped there while the subdivision was even being built. So there's a lot of negligence all the way around, and it goes high from high to low. But we've got the primary players that were involved in this since uh, 1945 to 1970 and to present time. When did you find out the results of the testing? And how long between then did it take for the story to go public? As it has very widely, especially in the St. Louis area, though I've seen it on national media as well. It has been a couple of months since I was told that the results were in. And then about a month or so after that, I was told the specifics of the test results. And then a month after that, then we filed the lawsuit and have also gone public to the media. 
they're all in all of all about sixty to ninety days at the most. Speaking of the media, how has the coverage been? Has there been empathy for you or sympathy? Has it been accurate, or have there perhaps been other attitudes coming in? The St. Louis media has been very well receiving of this news. They have been very cordial, very respectful to my husband and I when they have come. Some of them I have spoken to before for interviews in previous years. So we do have a relationship. Some of them are new because some of the other reporters have been moved to other beats, and so we lose contact with those. But all in all, it's been a very good response. I am pleased with the coverage. It has been very accurate so far. Which is at times remarkable when it comes to anything to do with nuclear. With this story blowing up in such a personal way, how have you and your husband and your family been doing with it? How are you coping with it? Actually, we've been coping with it very, very well. We have been very, very involved in this landfill. I had even been subpoenaed by the landfill because of a previous lawsuit that the Republic had served myself and Don Chapman. So I am not unfamiliar with that aspect of being an activist and uh, being held accountable. They know me full well. I have been on panels speaking with Russ Naki, who is the Vice President of Communications for Republic Services. He knows me well. He knows where I stand. I make no bones about it. So we've been handling it very well. I still continue to do what I do. I just need to be very respectful and mindful, and I'm going to do that because this is not only going to affect me, but it will affect the case for many others, and I don't want to damage that in the least. What's next for you? I don't like to count my chickens before they're contaminated. <laughs> but so far, they're looking pretty pretty solid on that end. So I'm just hoping for the EPA to do the right thing. Gina McCarthy said that relocation Voluntary relocation was not off the table. We're hoping that she will pull through with that. We're going to hold her feet to the fire and hold her true to what she has said. We also are going to hold EPA responsible, that's what's next, for them to follow through with their testing. Come up here to Spanish Village. This whole neighborhood needs to be tested. And those that don't want to be tested, that's fine. I fight for the non-believers, the fence-sitters, and the believers. They can all benefit from this from one way or the other, and if they choose not to, so be it. But at least give them a fighting chance. At least give them the opportunity to have the knowledge to decide what to do with it. I mean, that's all we ever asked for was just to be treated like people, not like trash. And what do you think is the best possible result? that can come from this if EPA and Republic and the Missouri governmental officials as well all come into alignment and go, we've got to help these people. What would that look like? I hope that would also involve input from this community rather than them deciding for us what is best because we are the ones living it. We are the ones that have been living it, that have endured it, and we are the ones that know what's best for ourselves, not those with the powers that be. So they need to listen to the people. They need to consult the people, and the people need to be involved in every step of the way of this decision. Is there anything you can think of that we need to cover that we haven't? For those of you that don't know about Westlake Landfill, please join Westlake Landfill Facebook group and Just Moms STL. Facebook page, and also check out www.stlradwayslegacy.com for more information and how you can help. Of course, we are wishing you the best as this continues to move forward. This is from one aging hippie to another. <laughs> I thank you so much. We've been in touch a lot on Facebook with each other, and I want to thank you now for being in touch with the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat by being my guest on the show this week. My pleasure, and I am humbled that you asked me, Libby. Thank you so very much.
Robin Ellison Daly. She recently spoke at a meeting of the St. Louis County Council, and in this brief clip, you will get a chance to hear her energy and natural eloquence when she speaks in public. This audio is taken off a video we found on Kristen Camuso's Facebook page, and while it's not the best quality, I believe it's worthwhile to hear how this woman, who you've just gotten to hear in a more personal sense, speaks truth to power in public. I am one of the residents that has the contamination from the Westlake Landfill Manhattan Project regulars in their home. I moved there in 1999. I didn't know I was living and moving next to a radioactive superfund. Had no idea. It's a big secret in St. Louis. They don't even allow you to disclose it. It's not necessary when you're buying a home. I didn't sign up to live next to one, and I sure as hell didn't want to be contaminated by one. Because EPA and Republic Services said, there's nothing to worry about. We know where all the grad waste is, and we know exactly where it is offside. And it's not where you're at. Well, guess what? The joke's on now. I'm contaminated now. And I want you to know that I have heavily landscaped my yard since 1999. My husband and I have dug holes almost two feet deep to plant trees and other things. So, I mean, we are really into it up to here with this stuff. And now it's in my house, too. So I just can't get away from it. And on top of that, it was our worst fears realized. We, my husband and I had hoped we wouldn't be contaminated, but we always tell them that in the back of our minds there was always that possibility. Well, we've got irrefutable, indisputable proof. This is a thorium that can be found in the United States. It has a monzonite signature, which is a fingerprint, a DNA, that traces it all the way back to Shinka Lokwe Mine in the Belgian Congo. Now, there's no way in H-E-double-L I got that from anywhere but the Westlake landfill, because that cannot be had on these United States soil. So all I can say is here's the face of contamination when we were constantly told not to worry about it. My government has failed me. The EPA has failed me. I look to the council. We have to start at the county level. My God, my own Richmond council and my own mayor could really give two boots about it. I've been shut down by the previous mayor speaking about it at a council meeting. We're referred to as those people, those people up there that are bringing trouble into our neighborhood, stirring stuff up, giving Richton a bad name. Richton gave themselves a bad name. By continuing the silence, it creates the apathy and it perpetuates the lie. And the lie continues and the homes get sold and the unsuspecting homeowners keep coming and coming and coming. But my house can't be remediated. You know why? Because the source of where it came from is still there and it still has the red waste in it. So what are they going to do? Clean me up every couple of years? Clean my house? I don't need to go through that. I'm 61 years old for crying out loud. I moved to Bridgeton to retire. And this is what I retired into. So that's my sad story. I'm looking for some help. I'm looking for more than, you know, we're really sorry. I, I know you're all sorry, and that is a genuine feeling. But I've heard enough of that. I feel like we're sorry, pat you on the fanny, send you on your way. But thank you very much for listening to me. We are a hurting community. Not everybody wants to leave, but I do. That was Robin Ellison Daly speaking before the St. Louis County Council. I suggest you follow her suggestions and connect on Facebook with Just Moms STL and the Westlake Landfill Groups. Then you can go visit their website to get some background information at JustMomsSTL.com. I'll have all these links up on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com, under this episode, number 283. Activist shout-out! My gratitude to the contacts and friends who reached out immediately as yesterday's Fukushima earthquake first hit. Our European special correspondent, Sean Arclight, Patrick Wilson of Activate Media, Kimberly Roberson of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, you were the first three to get to me. 
And then there are all the rest of you who sent links to live streaming news sites, news articles you found. It was really a community response that helped me follow what was happening. This is the kind of networking that allows me to cover the nuclear news quickly and specifically. You are my eyes and ears on the ground wherever you go. So thanks to all of my special correspondents, and that includes you. And a reminder that on December 2nd through 4th, the National Grassroots Radioactive Waste Strategy Summit is being held in Chicago under the aegis of Beyond Nuclear, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NEARS, and Chicago's NEIS, Nuclear Energy Information Service. NEARS has been running a series of three webinars to give background information on the issues that are going to be discussed, and there are great grounding in learning exactly what we're up against with the terrible amounts of nuclear waste that are out there, just waiting for all future generations to have to deal with. So to learn more, contact NEARS.org, BeyondNuclear.org, or NEIS.org. And remember to bundle up because I'm from Chicago and I know how cold it can get in December. Here's today's final thought. We here in the U.S. have been, shall we say, distracted. Many of us downright depressed over the results of our most recent presidential election. But if there's anything that can trump the Trump it's the immediate threat of another nuclear disaster, the kind of threat that reared its ugly head yesterday, Monday, November 21st. Receiving word of the 7.3 earthquake off the coast of Fukushima, the tsunami warning, and links to live video feeds waiting and watching for the tsunami to hit, links sent to me from two separate sources within three minutes all of it worked together to flash me back to March 11, 2011, and the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, a time when I didn't know I was about to become an anti-nuclear activist, but knew only that I could not tear myself away from the computer at any hour of the day or night. Post-traumatic stress functions as a time warp a point clearly made by Patrick Wilson of Activate Media, who wrote yesterday when he sent me one of the links, Haven't we seen this movie? Yes, we have. And watching yesterday's events play out in real time, with no guarantee of a happy ending, brought it all back to life in living color. Even though the results of yesterday's earthquake and tsunami are nowhere near as devastating as what happened a little more than five and a half years ago. Let's consider the unavoidable facts. Japan has had another major earthquake off the coast of Fukushima. This earthquake generated a tsunami that hit in multiple places up and down the Japanese coast, with some of the waves measuring up to four and a half feet. Those terrifying whoop-whoop sirens sounded again, loudspeakers blaring warnings to the people to evacuate, take cover, stay away from the water. It was terrifying. And if I can be triggered 5,300 miles away, I cannot imagine the terror of those in Japan, especially in Fukushima Prefecture, especially near the coast. Now, 24 hours later, I watch the spin settle in. Japan called the quake at 7.3 when it happened, and later upgraded it to 7.4, while the U.S. Geological Service downgraded it to a 6.9. You know, 6 is so much less frightening than 7 when you talk about earthquakes, don't you think? And that, of course, is what United States mainstream media is reporting, a 6.9. TEPCO announced that there were no problems at Fukushima Daiichi because of the quake, and they made that announcement only 40, four zero minutes after the quake happened. Forty minutes! 
They must have a fortune teller, a soothsayer, a seer on staff who looked into a crystal ball and said, eh, no big problem. Of course, I'd fire that soothsayer in a minute because not one word was said at that time by TEPCO of a spent fuel pool where the pump shut down, that there could be cracks in welds and bolts of the tanks holding more radioactive water, two silt fences, who even knew there was such a thing, but two silt fences meant to contain radioactive particles in the port were damaged. The water pumps shut down at Unit 3 of Fukushima Daini, but yes, they went online after nine hours. This time. What about the next? Because, yes, there can be a next. It can happen again at any time. What will it take for sanity to prevail over greed when it comes to nuclear? Yesterday, we got lucky. It was, as best we know at this moment, a near miss on a larger disaster. And because it wasn't over-the-top horrific, we'll quickly be manipulated into thinking it was no big deal, no one was hurt, Nothing was destroyed. It's all fine. blah de blah blah And let's build that new luxury hotel in Fukushima and entice foreigners to ski the Fukushima slopes and send school kids on bus tours through it all to write reports for their classes and convince everybody that nuclear is great and safe. And hey, what about those Olympics? But you know, something did happen. And something else can, and inevitably will, one day, or the next, or the one after that, or the one after that. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, November twenty second, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from miningawareness.wordpress.com, fukuleaks.org, NHK, The Guardian, enenews.com, rt.com, TEPCO, newsonjapan.com, asahi.com, japantimes.com, timesunion.com, stlouispostdispatch.com, stltoday.com, msudenver.edu, networkworld.com, theatlantic.com, reuters.com, wsj.com, energytransition.de, Dr. Gordon Edwards, the poor, deluded, karma-challenged copywriters at World Nuclear News, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the resolute planet protectors who gather at the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook, which you are all invited to like so that you join us and share our posts with your friends and family. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio, in Hollywood. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. A reminder that your support is the lifeblood of Nuclear Hot Seat. So if you value verifiable news about nuclear issues delivered with just the slightest hint of humor, please consider helping us out with a donation. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is downloaded in 112 countries, so yes, the activists are linking so let's all get to work and not go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. <laughs>